This is Kelly Johnson, writer of episode 514, Mr. Raleigh Sinclair III. You're listening to The Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Aaron quite possibly will need therapy himself by the end of the show this week. Welcome to the award-winning Blacklist Exposed podcast. I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I am Agent Aaron Peterson. And get ready for a mirror ball full of double entendres. As we now have pseudo doppelgangers, people. That's right, not twins. We've got doppelgangers. Thanks for joining us once again as we discuss number 51 on the blacklist, Mr. Riley Sinclair III, written by Kelly Johnson and directed by Christina Gee. Show notes and other intel for this episode of The Blacklist Exposed can be found at theblacklistexposed.com. We should say congratulations to Kelly Johnson as this was her first episode ever. And well done. Very well, well done. done. Very well clever, done. Clever twist on the old twins angle. And you know how much Aaron hates twins. I do. So <laughs> there was a part where I'm like, this better not be twins. It better not be twins. And it better not be doppelgangers. And it wasn't. That worked out great. Yes. Cool, cool. And plus they had a Game of Thrones throw in there. It was kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Game well, of Thrones. Or Westworld, depending on which masks you were looking for. Were there masks in there from Game of Thrones and Westworld? Well, yeah. He had his little shelf of uh, face molds. You know, oh, Mr. Sinclair oh, had. So. Oh, I see what you're saying. See, I'm sitting here going, wait, they had Anthony Hopkins' face on the shelf? I didn't see that. That would have been that cool. Been amazing. That would have been cool. <laughs> yeah, what? Is that Jon Snow? <laughs> he knows nothing. Well, we did ask you guys a profiling question before the Olympic coverage took over the airwaves. Congratulations to the U.S. men's curling team. First gold medal ever. That was awesome. But I'm, I'm not, I know. No, curling is not a sport. I'm sorry. You're you're basically you're a glorified janitor on the ice. Really, think about it. Sweep the leg, Johnny. Sweep the leg. <laughs> <laughs> okay, profile question. Uh, why did Dom not tell Liz he was her grandfather? And let's check with the poll results. Eighty-seven percent feel Dom was protecting Liz by withholding the information. Ten percent said a spy never gives up his secrets. 3% said he withheld because Dom was afraid of red. Ooh. Interesting. Wow. Uh, and, Marta oh. also chimed in, said Liz was at his house in FBI capacity, so he protected his identity as a spy, which I guess kind of goes with the spy never gives up a secrets angle. Hmm. And Danielle Howlett said, I think he didn't tell her because first she caught him off guard. He didn't expect for her to show up there. He doesn't know how to tell her. He's protecting her. All right. Eh, sure. So with the 87%. So I think we're pretty much covered off on that one. What about for next week? I had a question and you had a question. So we throw out both of them or do you want to just go with yours? I think, I think mine works better. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the question is, what does Red need Sinclair for? What purpose does Red need Sinclair for? But if you're feeling adventurous and you want to answer Troy's too, what is yours? Mine was, do you think Singleton is a good cop or is he truly a bad cop? So does that mean if he's both in interrogations, he just leaves the room and comes back angry? Hey, it said Get doppelgangers, it? twins, could be. <laughs> don't, 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 don't even put it in anybody's head. <laughs> How many singletons are there? Mm. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, now before someone makes different versions of Aaron, let's get on to this week's case profile. Would that make you happier or sadder if there was more than one of me? Depends which one's paying for lunch on Sunday. But um, bum So who is Mr. Raleigh Sinclair the third anyway? Well, first, he's John Noble. What? Which means, if you've never listened to this podcast, I, I will inform you, Troy was smiling more than Brian's wife in that flashback scene. Am I wrong? Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> yes, just yes, I was. Yes, I was. You were a happy fellow. If you've never seen Fringe, which he mentions about every five seconds, John Noble was one of the stars of Fringe. Great, the, fantastic the work star on that show. Of the star of the show. Uh, really? Wasn't it more was, Anna Turf? Torf? Torf. Anna Torf? Wasn't it more her? She was, but it's really Walter's story. It, okay, I give you that. Anyway, Sinclair is a Houdini of murder alibis, a master in the art of manipulation. And here is what he does. Essentially, after being contracted by a client, we never really find out how he finds these clients. Is there one ad? Is it guns and ammo? What? Yellow pages. Yeah. <laughs> He's contacted by a client who wants to kill somebody. 
And then he finds a person similar in appearance that he then molds literally into their double. So it's not twinsies. It's not doppelgangers. He is actually creating a double for the person in a way. Then he has the murderer follow strict rules and habits like jogging and waving to the same people. And when the client kills whomever they, whoever needs killing, which, uh, they, they must kill them personally. That's one of the things that he requires. And then the double will take their place on that routine and provide the perfect alibi. Sinclair then disposes of the doubles, much like a serial killer. That whole concept, fascinating to me. And it, Loved it. And, and the fun thing about this was that it almost harkened back to season one. Because, you know, as we get on in the episodes here, it's always hard to come up. We were talking with the, well, it was the Johns, right? On the 100th mm-hmm. episode. They talked about it's kind of hard to come up with new ideas and new stories when you're this long into the game. And it's kind of harkens back to the Alchemist episode in a way where the Alchemist was replacing bodies in order to get criminals to escape by killing doubles by changing the DNA at the surface level. So I was like, this is kind of like the Alchemist episode. So I'm thinking hmm, maybe we're going to get some mythology type stuff here again as we kind of break down these doubles, doppelgangers, imposter theory, anyone? possible mm. we'll come back to that well he has helped at least 51 others avoid murder charges of course the task force saves the wife catches brian who's the latest client in case you didn't realize but you knew that was gonna happen right we knew that was gonna happen yeah because he stood over her too long and said i'm gonna kill you now just enough yeah. time for the car to pull up you <laughs> okay this is my only real nitpick of this episode i really i thought it was a great episode i had a lot of fun when he's in the garage and he's had months to prepare for this, point blank range, everybody knows two things. One, don't monologue. You see movies. Don't do it. You know, I know you wanted to know that you, haha, I got the better of you. And two, maybe you should have taken some target practice. You know, get the shot clean. Get in there. You're point blank and you missed. You hit her, you grazed her elbow. What? Come on. Point blank. And then this is where. Darren's going to be like Troy's the dark one again, but I was kind of hoping that he would finish the job. <laughs> wow, man, that's going deep. I mean, it, it, it would have been somebody sh- hurt you, Troy. Well, you want would, to talk about it? It would have been a shock. Want to go to therapy? No. With- <laughs> I don't want to go to therapy. Martha Plimpton, <laughs> uh, Goonies forever. But uh, no, I mean, I really, really thought it would have been a cool twist because the expectation is, oh, he's going to monologue. They're going to get there in time. They're going to save the day. It's like it would have been cool if he would have actually done the deed. And then gotten caught. Mm. It just would have been something different, you know. That's yeah, my that's I, my only nitpick because she did cheat on him. I mean, she kind of deserved it. Whoa, 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 whoa! That is like apples and t- t- turnips. <laughs> it's not relatable. Give me a break. She had that coming. God, send the angry email to Troy. Anyway, you are dark savage. I personally hate when TV shows use doppelgangers or twins. We have talked about this numerous times. It's always my fear that it's something because people have made the the inclination or the given the impression that maybe Red is a twin, which to me is like, ah, and I start crying inside. It's my worst possible scenario. I just, I just, to me, twins scream soap opera. I'm just not a fan, like, except for the, unless Danny DeVito's in it. But this, I love this. I thought it was a really clever updated twist on the cliche of doppelgangers or twins. So I was a big fan of this story element. I really like this character as a whole, not just because it's John Noble, just in, in in concept and also in realization. It just really, really worked for me. I love the meticulousness of the, of the plan too, to be able to rent the apartment, go on this jog for weeks, months, days on end, whatever it ended up being. It mm-hmm. just, just that dedication to the, the whole concept I thought was really fantastic, actually. Sadistic in a lot of ways, but fantastic. Well, I mean, it, it's if you stop and think about it, yeah, it's probably a, quite a stretch, but I don't care. I still really enjoy it. <laughs> There's so many movies that if you stop and think about it, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to make as much sense. Sometimes you just got to go, all right, TV logic. I get it. And it works for me. I just thought it was a really, cl- it was really clever to me. Very clever. And for you, Troy, John Noble, one of your favorite actors, loved him on Fringe, completely different character on Fringe, although here it's kind of, I guess, a little bit of a combination of Malters. Did he deliver as a blacklister for you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, when I was watching this, I was thinking in my mind, it's like, this is almost as if 
if the if Walter and Walter Knit were merged into one person, I think this is the character you would get. It's a little bit creepy and sadistic in the fact that he is about crime at the end of the day, but he mm-hmm. had that kind of almost uh, like he lost some of his mind a little bit. He was still kind of frantic and schizo and OCD. And I really liked seeing that characteristic come out again. It's almost like going back and watching Fringe for a little bit. It was, it was a lot of fun. And I know Kelly specifically said that she wrote this character with John Noble in mind. So the fact that we got John Noble for this episode is fantastic. I could see that. It really feels like it was because it does feel like there's a little bit of Walter in here, like both sides of Walter. If you watch the show, you know what I mean by that. It it feels like you've got both both worlds of Walter. But irregard uh, irregardless irregardless. I thought that was clever. It was really. clever. It was very oh, good. Uh, but irregardless, John Noble and James Spader acting together when they're talking about their book club. Oh my gosh, it's such a great scene. Such mm-hmm. a good scene. It was so witty and back and forth it was just i i drooled i was like give me more of this please excellent cool man love it i'm glad you got i know that you've been really excited about this for a while so i'm glad you finally got to see your boyfriend up on the screen i'm just glad it played off well i I, I was nervous i was like oh you bring john noble in and then what if it's not a great episode and this was great i love the idea i love the twist love the concept everything about it was great great and it looks like he he's not done yet doesn't it right he could come back I don't think could. I think the more, uh, I think it's more of when. Well, let's let the fans talk about that when we get the special agent intel in a bit. They got <laughs> okay. some. They got some crazy ideas. Let me tell you. All right. Well, if you never listened before, we always break down the crux of the episode, and then we would jump right into the characters. Now it's character time, but we start with music because this show is all about the music. It is, and we got two tunes this week. Uh, so as Brian makes his move on Nikki, even though he needs more target practice, we hear "The Devil You Know" from the X Ambassadors as it plays through Samar and Wrestler arriving on the scene, and then later on in the episode, as Kahil is laid to rest, or was it the other Kahil? Uh, Singleton is also let in on the biggest secret about Reddington so far. We hear Cut Me Down by Kevin Morby. And as always, you can get these songs on the Spotify playlist uh, curated by The Blacklist themselves over on Spotify, or you can get the same list on Apple Music curated by us. Just find the links in the case profile for Mr. Rotley Sinclair the Third. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Dembe, moving on to the rest of the characters, he's really just driving Miss Freddy this week. Dines with Fred and his homeless friend. Apparently, he's pretty bad at chess, too. <laughs> that was pretty funny. <laughs> and, and why is Paris cooking for him? If Dembe can cook, why doesn't Dembe cook for Red every now and then? Just curious. I mean, seriously, he's already driving him around. At what point? And he's saving his ass over time after time. I think it's okay to have this guy cooking food. And apparently, that's all he does all day long. That's his job. That's it. Apparently, he's amazing at it. Well, how much does he eat? How much does Red eat that he needs a guy there that, that spends all day cooking? I think Red's the kind of guy that does enjoy a good meal. Like He appreciates the finer things in food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're so funny. I think he eats too much. That's what I'm thinking. Obviously, you're spending too much time in the kitchen if you got a guy there all day. Mostly, I'm just jealous that I don't have one. That's exactly where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. Cooper tells uh, Red that Liz has to keep her nose clean to come back now now it's a problem <laughs> what <laughs> i mean cooper you've been riding the gray line like all season why is that an issue at this point which moral stance will cooper take this week filming at 11 <laughs> <laughs> that part is getting a little yeah but he was still i mean uh, you know how do you not love cooper but later at the end cooper receives uh, the letter that Red gives him, which has 51 cases that can now be closed, and 27 of those can still be charged. In your opinion, is that worth letting a known murderer go? I think it's a fair trade. And even though he mentioned that because of your country's jury system and of du- uh, double jeopardy, mentioning the your again, your jury, the, mm-hmm. the, uh, the thing that he does mention is that because he also has the location of all of the doubles and where they're buried – they can actually go after all 51 people because they can charge the people that got off on the double jeopardy with a different crime with the conspiracy to commit murder versus actually committing murder. So, yeah. So for 51 cases, I think that's absolutely a fair trade. All right. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> I, would, I would agree. I mean, honestly, probably at eight, I would have been cool with it. So you, you get up to 51, really 27. I mean, that's, at least more than three times what I would consider 
solid. So yeah. Plus, he, he probably had the same deal like Fagan had, right? Fagan's like, hey, Fagan, I know you're out now, but no starting fires unless I tell you to. So I'm sure it was the same kind of thing. Like, hey, Sinclair, don't be killing people unless I tell you to. Otherwise, I'll turn you into the FBI myself. <laughs> so he's a, he's a good well, guy until Red lets him loose. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> There's also this conversation he had with Red in the car, which I thought was interesting. Nothing ever turned up. Some people are truly alone in this world. Like Katarina's bones never turned up and he just kind of goes, yep. Like he was really contemplating that. But I don't know if he was really upset about Cahill or if he was like, oh, I did this to myself or I did this when she went to the ocean. And I have no idea where she went. I mean, it seemed like that was a line thrown in there to talk about the mythology aspect to me. Yeah, I think so. That feels right. That feels right. Well, no, it doesn't. I just want to make you feel good. I mean, it feels like it could mean anything, really. It could mean anything. He's like, I just, nobody came to the station to check up on him. So, yep, I guess I guess he was a loner. And Red's like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, Wrestler has very little to do except drive his SUV straight into a suspect. I thought that was hysterical. Or did, he, or did he run into the car that was already there? I'm just wondering. No, he ran into the suspect. The guy was running out of the exit, and he hit him. It was timed very perfectly. It was pretty conveniently timed. I'm not going to lie, but you know, Samar was getting tired. She was tired of running. Yeah. She's getting shot at too. Yeah. He does. Uh, she was all matrix style on the stairwell there. Do you see that? She was like, pshaw, pshaw. she was, she was kicking in. I was waiting for her to beat it, his silly ass down. And then SUV pulled out, kind of stole her thunder, but whatever. He does get to the, once again, thumb his nose at red, keeping a murderer free for his own selfish benefit. Rustler. I mean, come on. At some point you got to look inward, man. <laughs> What, just, what do you think? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. I get it though. He's he he is very adamant that he is no longer going to be under Red's thumb or anyone else's thumb. So he's very much trying to get back to who he is. And I and I do respect that because you know I felt like we were losing that character wrestler, and it's good to get that back. And I think it was was earned because he's just willing to sacrifice himself. He's already give given his confession. Cooper already has his confession, so. Yeah, I'm actually okay with that. Yeah. I, I, I love the conversation, the banter between the two of them again, because it kind of shows the the wrestler and red dynamic that we've been used to over the couple of seasons. So mm. it'll be interesting to see how their dynamic continues to play off, because it seems like red is building up to something. Like he's putting people in place or gathering people that he needs, and maybe that comes to a head and wrestler calls him out on it eventually. Yep, and Samar. Well, actually, Samar and Aram. She pretty much puts together the how of what Sinclair is doing, along with Aram, who puts the exactly how. After he does some facial recognition, and it says that it's not the same guy in the DeMarco case, so it's got to be a double, right? It absolutely is right. The computer never lies. Aram yeah. said so. <laughs> That's what he said. So, and that's about it for these two. But I, I feel like they were working uh, in conjunction on this case. They, it felt like a couple crime solving there, heart to heart, if you will. Heart to heart, nice call. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun to to see them in the field doing a case together? I'm sure it'll come eventually. It's probably a poor choice of words. But yeah, I hope so. I would like to see them in the field actually actively solving a case together. If that, you know, maybe they're trying to save wrestler. He's trapped in an. He's trapped in something because he's been hit in the head. <laughs> he likes to get hit on the head. I remember those days when we were drinking whenever he got punched in the face? <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a lot of drunk days. So long ago. <laughs> uh, all right, Detective Singleton. Big change. Let me ask you a question straight off the gate, straight out of the gate, not off it, just out of it. Maybe on it. Maybe next to it. Maybe on me laying around it. I don't know. Is he a dirty cop? Do you think he's dirty? That was the hard part about this episode at the end there. Like, he's, he's clearly with Garvey, working with Garvey, sharing information with Garvey. But is he doing it in a capacity of he thinks he's truly, they're cops working together. And he's getting played himself by Evil Glenn, Mr. Ian Garvey. Or is he really working with Ian Garvey and just playing Liz the whole time? So it, at this point, it's still a little hard to figure out what side of the coin he's on. Hence why I wanted to know, do you think he's good or evil? In my question. Yeah, I think he's he's not a dirty cop. 
I think they proved it in this episode. He's not a dirty cop. He's actually a good cop trying to solve a crime. And his boss is nefarious. Evil Glenn Garvey is, <laughs> is a, he, he's, he's the wicked man. You know, he's the, he's Oz. He's the man behind the curtain. He's pulling all these strings. And a couple of those cops are dirty, but I don't think Singleton is one of them. Which means Singleton probably is not long for this world. All right. So now Detective Singleton, now that we, I think he's a good cop. You're not convinced yet. There's probably people that are both on both sides. Liz brings him in. She makes the conscious choice to bring him in, whether he's dirty or not. I mean, if he's dirty, it's more obvious, I would say. But is this a smart or just a horrible, horrible mistake? Move. Well, she what called- kind of move is this? Yeah, and, and I think that's the question. Is is it a trap? So the That's a trap. There's a Star Wars reference again. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the um she cuz she said she has to make a phone call. So how much of that phone call was, "Hey, I got this guy. Is it okay to bring him into the post office? What are we going to do?" Or was it more, "Hey, I got this guy. We could totally trap him and find out some information. Let's go ahead and pull one over on him." So I I think that'll be the interesting thing to see is how it plays out now that they're he's down there. Are they going to totally rope him in and figure out what he knows and then arrest him at the end of this? Or do they truly find out that he's actually a good guy and maybe hopefully save his life? Man, there, there's two ways this whole thing works out. One, they're giving us an extra character, you know, for more regular basis, which we probably don't need because we already are having a hard time getting wrestler involved and getting some more involved and. Aram involved. We got characters. We want to see more screen time, so we don't need an extra character. But I do like him. I, I do like single. I I find him really inter- like he's very wrestler esque. I guess in a way. Yeah, I'd say and, so. And I like that. In my opinion, because I, I feel like he's a good cop now, and it completely caught me by surprise because I was fully on board. Oh, he's a dirty cop, and I'm I'm pretty much digging that he's around. But now you know that now he's seen it. He's dead. I mean, he's dead. He's basically, he just became an expendable. Yeah. Either they kill him because he's a dirty cop. Garvey kills him because he's not needed anymore and he knows too much. So yeah, I, I think he, he's not long for this world for sure. No, not at all. Not at all. Man, what are you going to do? What Garvey's going to be around for a while though. You think so? Like you think it's going to be a finale thing? Kind of like Kaplan was last year? Yeah, I think so. I think it'll probably go that far. Do you really? I mean, I, yeah, I, at this point, he is the big bad. Of the, he's like the Buffy big bad of the back season, right? I think so, yeah. I mean, you could say maybe two episodes, three episodes, you could wrap this thing up. I mean, we've been going on it since Ruin, or even since Tom, the Tom finale, that Garvey's been involved. So Garvey might be getting a little bit long in the tooth, and maybe we could see him go away in two episodes, potentially. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll get the answer to the suitcase until the end of the season. Or the, oh, or the or the or the duffel gotcha. or the duffel bag, whatever you want to call it now. Maybe they gotcha, got it. Maybe, gotcha, maybe gotcha. they got it in a crystal vase. <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> we haven't seen the duffel bag in a long time. I don't know where the bones what? are. <laughs> That's true. They got to still be around somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. I sure hope so. Oh well. He does say at the end of the episode that I think I can help you with that. When she said she wants to find, you know, he wants to help her find Tom's killers. Do you think that means he knows Garvey is dirty? Nah, I or don't, am I just making a leap with that one? It might be a leap because I don't know if he can put. I don't know if he puts two and two together that it goes back to Garvey because I don't think he thinks Garvey works with the Nash Syndicate. I think Garvey's trying to find the Nash Syndicate. I don't know if he puts the two and two together that Navarro was working for Garvey. So no, I don't think so. Okay, it was worth a shot. I was just curious. Okay, speaking of Garvey, speaking of evil Glenn Garvey, he's a marshal, right? Yep. Assembles a task force of cops. Right? Seems like it. Also but, running some thugs, correct? Yep. That don't shave. What? <laughs> well, that's n- no thug shaves because you got to you gotta have that five o'clock shadow to look nefarious. That's just the rule. They teach that in thug school. Got it. Mm-hmm. Making a note. So what, is, <laughs> what is going on with this guy? What, what, do you, what do you think his deal is at this point? Do you have a theory or an idea at anything yet? Well, the, the the big running theory was that maybe he was this guy in the fire that was handing the bunny in the closet because of the ring on his finger. And, mm-hmm. they, and they keep showing the ring pretty predominantly in these shots. Like he's drinking coffee and hey, in case you forgot, here's this ring on his finger kind of shots. But the ring is got like, it seems like a greenish opal color. 
it doesn't seem like it's that bright red of the ring that was in the fire. Now, it could be many years later. It's tarnished. He doesn't clean it very well. Doesn't go over to the jewelers to get a polish. Who knows, right? But but they do focus on the ring quite a bit in this episode. And I have to say that that's got to be a clue, right? I think so. I mean, why would you keep showing it? And why would it? I mean, it's an ugly ass ring. I mean... <laughs> Well, it looks like something my grandpa would have wore. So I, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, I think that was a cool looking ring nowadays. Yeah, it's, no. like, it's like a class ring, kind of. Kind of. Yeah, I mean, and that could be. Maybe that's a connection. Maybe he was part of Red's class. Maybe he was in this Navy class. Maybe man say, oh, he ended up in the Marshals. Possibly. I'm not sure. I don't know if anybody's ever. I'm sure there's some internet detectives that have figured a lot more of this out. I haven't really been perusing online to see, but yeah, I think there's gotta be something. You can't have a ring that, that closely resembling one of the most prominent scenes in the show and not have it be reflective of that. I'm sure there's already, I, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't think. Yeah. I'm sure there's already the blacklist ring podcast out there. Cause I've seen pictures all over the internet. Like, Ooh, it's a <laughs> ring. Look at the ring. Zoom it in. Bring it back up. They need to call a ROM go through 700 pictures of the ring. And then maybe they can find the one that'll actually match. One ring to rule them all. And in the blacklist, bind them. <laughs> Lord, we, we both need to get out of the house more. <laughs> all right. Well, speaking of needing to get out of the house more, Dr. Fulton, Goonies never say die, Martha Plimpton. Thanks for coming to my TV screen. Shut I up, I love Alf. having her there. <laughs> hey, you guys. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Martha Plimpton, I think she's always fun to watch. And she shows up as a shrink. Which I think, was, bit. I think it was perfect for her, to be quite honest. It, she's got that spunky, fiery, like, I'm not going to take crap from nobody kind of angle, which totally fits her character. She was a little bit predisposed in her leanings, but she proves to be a pretty formidable force for a resource for the FBI, I should say. She wants to ensure Liz can function without the corruption that inhabits her father. Okay. She's pretty convinced. She, Yeah, she's pretty convinced that, that Red is definitely... Uh, piece of garbage and also that Liz might be affected by that. And also a hell of a lot of people know about Red at this point, the task force, his relationship to Liz. Why do so many people know about this secret? That's a really good question. I mean, it's becoming, it's becoming like uh, watching arrow or one of those CW shows. Everybody knows who everybody is. <laughs> well, I mean, th- this is, why are you wearing a mask? We all know who you are. This is the FBI's shrink, right? So mm-hmm. I'm sure at some point, there's, you know, hey, I'm going to tell you something. It's classified. You got to sign an NDA and, uh, you know, all kinds of like third children and will testament the whole thing. Got to get it all down on paper before we tell you this, before you can interview Liz to get her job back. So maybe that's the case. I mean, it is it is within the family, quote unquote. So I don't know if everybody knows that Reddington works for the FBI. It feels like a lot of pe- this episode. A lot of people know. Yeah, cause Basically, because they're tailing them. Singleton's well, like, Singleton's doing his best Veronica Mars impression. No, Liz just brought him in. Yeah, but he captured the photo of him over at the uh, restaurant when they met yeah, together. Yeah, but that's not going to prove the task force exists and everything else. She brought him in. And then you've got uh, Dr. Fulton, who apparently needs to know so she can clear him, clear her. Which It just feels like there's a lot of people that know a very top-level secret. Well, I think that after five seasons, we should all know some top-level secrets. <laughs> uh, I really I love this character. My my only issue, and you have bear with me because it has to be a, it's a personal issue for me. The, the character is the, the scene in that car. My mother has worked in psychology for thirty years, and if any doctor approached a patient with "You disgust me," her license would be revoked immediately. And essentially, at that moment, he was a patient. So, because she wanted to meet with them both, absolutely correct, absolutely. So at that point, I'm like, ah, stop it. Maybe he just had lettuce in his teeth or something, and that's what was really grossing her out. But on the same token, what? <laughs> on the same token, it was a great scene, absolutely. So sometimes you gotta, you know, take your brain, check out the door, just enjoy the scene as it's written. It's TV. I really, I really enjoyed the scene. I love Red's reluctance, yet defending Liz at the same time. I mean, he's reluctant to actually be complicit in this session. Yet when it came time to it, he really threw down, Hey, push her, provoke her, judge her by what she does. And I thought that was a really good moment. You know what I loved about the scene? 
was Liz specifically because we've had this dark Liz momentum for so many episodes when mm-hmm. Liz kind of looks over and it's like, I am so sorry. This was the only way we could get him to meet. Part of me was like, I think you kind of wanted to set this up yourself too. <laughs> let's see what we can get. Yeah. Like, 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 like let's game the system, dad, let's work together and we'll totally corner her. That's kind of how I felt about that statement when she made it. I didn't know if that was just me or if anybody else felt that way, but I felt like it was kind of like, Mm-mm. I don't really want to do the therapy with red either. So let's just get this done without in the open. I do. I think it'd be fascinating to talk to. So what did you think when you killed your 88th man? <laughs> what was going through your mind when you slaughtered that family? And then later bought them a cookie <laughs> or did something nice for the, for the homeless lady. Right. Which we'll get to at some point. I don't know. So what what do you think about Dr. Fulton? You think Dr. Fulton's going to play a bigger part going on or is this like a couple episode runoff? What? Yeah, maybe one and done, maybe a second episode here or there. Because I think that with her saying, you know, I'm a daughter, that gets her reinstated. You think so? I think so. I think Fulton wanted her to admit, like, just Liz, tell me, admit the fact that you are Reddington's daughter. I think that's what she wanted to hear. Mm-hmm. Because she said, hey, she's she's great. She, everything about her is awesome. The only thing that's a, a blemish on her record is that she's related to you. So once she admits that she's related to him, she can confront that demon and then go ahead and move forward and clear her conscience. So I think that's that, that was really it, and she's out. So I don't know if we'll see her again. If only audiences could admit that and move on. <laughs> <laughs> you think, do you think it was put in there won't. like this was our own therapy session? <laughs> I think it might very well be. I mean, it might be, it might be a Kelly and the writers going, guys, we already cleared this up. Why is it still coming up? It's her dad. We told you in season one, <laughs> you just didn't listen. Yeah. Yeah. You never know. You never know. All right. So now we're on the list. We've got Liz and red left. She's a widow. She's a mother. She's a cop. Turns out she's also a daughter and she's not very good at profiling herself, but who would be? She's been through hell. Comas, murder by broken glass have kept her a little preoccupied as of late. And we find out that the reason she desperately needs to go back, well, I think we kind of already knew that, was Liz needs the task force to catch Tom's killer. Do you think she still wants to kill Garvey when she finds him? Or is she going to actually go by the letter of the law at this point? Well, remember, she didn't kill Navarro. It was self-defense and it was an accident. Yeah, it was one of those TV murders. Yeah. But yeah. I, don't, I don't think she wants to kill Garvey. I think she wants to find out who is Garvey, why was she coming there, and get a damn answer as to what the whole thing was about in the first place. I think mm-hmm. that's more important. When she finds out why, she's immediately going to go from, I want to kill you, to I'm going to kill you, Red, and do like a complete flip on her mental capacity at that point. I keep telling you that that would be the most exciting. And to me, that feels like the cliffhanger that would be building, we would be building to, which would be... Um, I have no knowledge whatsoever. This is totally just me off the top of my head that Garvey reveals that the bones reveal something big and Liz threatens red. And then, you know, we come back next season with her going after red, her going after red, which I don't think she's ever really, really done. I mean, goes after him like balls at a wall. That's when the, that's when the poster comes out and it says red run, red run. (laughs) (laughs) That never occurred to me. That never occurred to me. <laughs> That's great. I love that. All right. We talked about the uh, the push for the provoker thing, but he also says, figure out a way to see past her grief and anger, and you'll see who she really is, everything that I'm not. So my question is, do you think she's really everything that Red is not? Because we've seen throughout the series several glimpses of her actually – being quite like Red in many ways. And I feel like it's not too far a leap to say that she could become Red very quickly. Or she could become Katarina very quickly. Or Katarina. Or she could just be Liz again, you know, and and find a way back to herself after all this is through with Tom's killers. Yeah, because let's examine that for a minute. So you have Red, and he's helping out these homeless people. So it looks like he's a good guy. And he does do that really nice, sweet thing to get Cahil's body, the barrier for, what was, it, her, what was her name, Dolores, uh, yes, the homeless Dolores. lady. Uh, so it seems like he's a good guy, right? So you have Liz, who ends up shooting the sheriff, and she's like, we got to get him to a hospital. And Red's like, do we really got to do this? Okay, fine, whatever. And they drive him to the hospital in season three. So 
parts of me are thinking like, is Red really that bad? I mean, again, he's a criminal. He's a bad guy. He does bad things, but he also has like a good side to him. So it's to say that she's everything he's not. I kind of sit there and I go back to, I hate to say I go back to my mother theory, but I never saw Katarina do anything good at all. And if Liz is a good person, when he says this, like she's completely opposite of me, that would lead me again to say that maybe she's different than her mother. Huh? All right, just, just run through that again, because I mean I'm with you, but I'm I'm trying to see what your point is. I guess. Well, if he's saying like she's everything, I'm not right, and if she's all, if Katarina was always doing bad things, we never saw her do anything good. She had to do good things though. Maybe I mean, we haven't seen maybe. it though on screen. We've That's seen, true. We, we haven't. We've seen Red do good deeds. Well, we have seen her be a mother and seem like she does care about her child. But that's it. A, a little. Well, well, that's a good thing. Almost a little Go. obsessive over her child, potentially. <laughs> Possibly. So, I mean, it just kind of like plays in my head. Like, if I've seen Red do good things, and if she's totally not anything Red, but we've seen Liz do good things, but we haven't seen Kenarina do good things, then maybe, <laughs> potentially. I don't know. Mm, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, moving on. She also, well, actually, no, we got, we got to talk about what Liz says about red before we get to the, the final one. We do some, some of what he's done is unimaginatively, uh, yeah, unimaginatively bad, but some of what he's done for me is unimaginatively good. Like what? Give her the music box reminder of her childhood. Yeah. yeah. Um, come after her and save her from Alexander Kirk. Um, let her marry Tom and not blow Tom up. Yep. All did, right. did kill her dad though. Suffocated him. <laughs> yep. That one's still there, right? Can't get rid of that one. That's pretty- you know, but it was humane. Yeah. But that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was bad. That's one of the unimaginatively bad ones. Exactly. So I, I just heard that line and I, but then I also, the thing that can always be off putting or frustrating for me, sometimes I personally forget Liz doesn't know everything he's done. So a lot of times I'm, I can't remember, does she know that he did this and this and this and this and this, or does she still not know that he did that and that and that and that? So it's hard for me sometimes because I can't remember what she knows and what she doesn't know sometimes because there's so many things that have happened. It's hard to remember what she is aware of him doing and what she isn't aware of him doing. Very. Yeah. All right. So this is the last one for Liz. She also remembers... As she practiced ballet, feeling as though someone was watching her. Is this why a lot of people are talking about this? Is this why Red watches the ballet every year? A lot of people are talking about it. I don't know. This is an interesting one because she Please says, tell me you went back and looked at that. or Oh, totally. The, okay. Um, the, the thing that's important about this scene when she says this is like, you know, I love ballet. I always felt like you know someone was there at the ballet at the graduation and at my wedding. So we know for sure that Red was at the wedding, thanks to the fall finale. Mm-hmm. We know that he's probably at the graduation because of the graduation photo and it's flat with a cat that hasn't been fed in over two seasons. So because we know those two things are true, it has to be true that, she, that he was at any of her ballet recitals. What, we, okay. what, what you can't assume is that... Just because you see one ballet recital in season one where he goes and buys out the theater for Swan Lake with a program from 1987, you can't assume that that ballet recital relates to Liz's ballet recital. People are making that connection automatically. She could have just been at Martha's School of Dance down the street, you know, (laughs) doing a recital and he's just standing in the window. It doesn't mean that she was at that particular Swan Lake ballet recital was the one that Liz was at. Because even when you see the shot of the little girl ballet dancer who is not two or three years old, which Liz would be at that age, based on the tombstone where she was 1985 when she was born, when she died in season three. So it could, the, the girl we see in the empty theater with the one director sitting in the seat, you know, she would clearly know that someone was there. So it wouldn't be, I felt like someone was watching me. I could clearly see if someone's watching me because there's nobody else in the theater. I don't. Eh, I will say I've been on that stage, like a stage. Those lights are coming in. It's not so easy to see people in the audience. That's true. That is true. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then it flashes when he's actually sitting there in the theater, and it's an older, you know, Swan Lake performer on the stage while he's holding the older program. 
So to me, I still think that he's watching Swan Lake reminiscing about Katarina specifically. My thought. Or if he is Katarina, then reminiscing about the time when she was a dancer herself. Right. But I don't think the Swan Lake ballet is Liz's ballet that she's referring to in this case. That makes sense to me. I can see why people would make the jump, right? Because we've seen this scene specifically, and it's a reference point that you say, oh, I remember that nugget, right? They're bringing back that Mm -hmm. nugget. But it might not necessarily be a nugget. I think it is, though. It feels like it to me. I mean... I don't really. Do you have any information that would contradict the possibility that that's what she means? Other than the fact that in order for Liz to have been in that ballet, Liz would have had to have been three years old or two year, two and a half years old if he was there in 1987, which seems to be like the last time he attended this play for the person that he was thinking about. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise he would have had a program from 88, 89, or 90. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm thinking it can't be Liz on the Swan Lake stage. She'd be too young. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I don't think so. I still, I'm still with that it. it's her. But that's because I don't have any information. I know some people think, well, maybe, isn't that Jennifer that was at the ballet? Da, 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 da. I don't know, man. We never hear anything about Jennifer. I still feel like Jennifer is like a, bre- like a red herring. <laughs> <laughs> all right we're moving on well we'll find out more i i feel like that's what she was referring to i think that was a so we knew that she kind of knew that red was watching her you know because we know about the ballet with red so it made sense to me but you're right the timeline could be a struggle for some and in fact it might be a struggle i don't know and it only it only seems like it works again because you you know he was at the wedding you know he's at the graduation because he's got the picture so clearly he was at a, at a ballet. We just don't know which ballet. Well, and the thing with this, okay, so the best thing about that line, it immediately got people to connect those two dots, right? Oh, instantaneously. It's the first place, the first place I went. Okay. So fair enough. But then I want to point out a line that comes up later in, in the show where he's talking about memory. Memories are constructed more like putting – together an ever-changing jigsaw puzzle than replaying a video. Agree. Which to me, I mean, it can mean a lot of different things. Obviously it can mean, you know, Liz remembers things differently than they happened. It could, it could easily mean that uh, our memories, you know, it seems like that would fit automatically, but does it really? So our, our memories are, are kind of like that because we, we automatically connect those dots just because of the ballet scene that nobody can really remember the exact details of because it was a few years ago. Totally, makes sense? Totally makes sense. Okay. And it could also be her in her own mind stating the fact that, oh, because I know someone, I felt someone at my wedding and I felt someone at my graduation, mm-hmm. it would make sense that there would be somebody at my ballet, but maybe there was nobody ever there. Exactly. You're just filling in the hole. You're filling in blanks that weren't there. And remember, she did have her memory jiggered with. A couple times. People people forget that because that that's kind of not been gone back to. I don't think much. Yeah, since, it seems like what, it, season two, maybe. Yeah, two. It's Luther been a long Braxton. time. Yep, yep, yep. It's been a long time. So, I mean, the memory thing I thought was a really clever line that covers a lot of bases. So there's a lot of wide open things here. Very interesting. A lot of interesting, interesting stuff in this episode. Red, boy, oh boy, does Red have a lot of double talk this week? Hmm. Literally and figuratively. Red loves therapy, but he's terrified of actually having to do it with Liz. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because I'm sure you want to Well, I'm think sh- about it. Well, the only thing here that I could come up with is that he doesn't want to be trapped in a corner where he's got to either lie or withhold more information or spill something he doesn't want to spill. So, yeah, I, I would get myself out of that situation as quickly as I could. Like, I'm no, no, I'm not doing this. <laughs> Yeah, man. I as soon as that happened, there's two there's two parts. Part of me is he just doesn't want to have to deal with this. He like he doesn't want to be part. And the other part of me is like he's afraid that he might let something slip. Yep. Because somebody who's trained in the you know somebody who is trained in this profession could maybe get him to misspeak or lose lose a step. Totally agree. Hard. Totally agree. Uh, therapy helped me become an entirely different person hashtag imposter theory hashtag mother theory hashtag 
just a completely yeah. different man. I mean, to to jump into the imposter theory for a minute. Or, so, or, or wait, sorry, I'll even go one further. Uh, hashtag daddy, not the daddy, because he had to give up the whole emotional aspect of being a father because Sam was the father. Also, mm-hmm. also works in this statement. Yeah, there there are a lot of ways that, that works, which is the the joy of it. We call and that the le- we call it the lexical ambiguity of the blacklist. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's definitely toying with the audience too. Like, haha, check it out. Here's Love a, it. I thought it was really funny. Here's an answer without giving you an answer. <laughs> we just fed it to you. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Side side story. My daughter uh, walked in the room while I was watching Blacklist, and you know, near the end, she hasn't watched it in a while, and she's watched. She's like, oh, so they finally admitted that that she's her his daughter. I said, well, yeah, well, well, yeah. She goes, well, you don't seem so sure. I'm like nobody that watches really is. She goes, still. I'm like, yeah, boy, they were. <laughs> They're really just running with that carrot, aren't they? <laughs> like, it's like, yep. And we keep chasing it. Maybe we'll catch it this week. Nope. So this is another one of those. It really feeds into every theory. The whole imposter thing, it, it could feed to that. Katerina, I don't I don't really, I guess in a way, you know, it's like therapy could t- teach you to ad- adopt mannerisms. But I just, I'm sorry. There's so many holes in that theory. It's like a screen door to me. The, uh, the theory that he's not, Really, her dad is, I don't know if that really applies, but definitely to, you know, but but sometimes we need to take things at face value. It could very easily be, I just need to be somebody different. I just need to be a master criminal. I need to hide, you know, I need to stop being the nice guy that I am. And I need to understand what it took to be ruthless. That could very, it could mean a lot of things is what I'm saying. I just had anger issues and I just wanted to be a nicer guy. It definitely doesn't mean that, and I think you'd know that. So what 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 is your personal – do you have a theory, or is it just an offhanded joke? No, 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 I mean, I still have to stand by the mother theory until other, until otherwise dead, but even if it's not the mother theory, I'm I'm with the imposter theory team at a minimum. You know, I absolutely think that that's what it was leaning towards, especially with the whole her body was never found, you know, I guess you're really alone in this world concept. There's a bunch of things in this that scream imposter theory in this entire episode. But again – is it because you're seeing it because you subscribe to that theory mm-hmm. or is it truly leaning that way? I don't know. And I'll, and I'll say that once again, cause it comes up a lot. If you, if you are sold on any one theory and I'm not sold on any one theory, I, I try really hard not to be, I have mine, which is the, you know, he's an uncle. That's really my big theory, but I'm not sold on it. I'm open to just about anything. I mean, just about anything, Troy, just about anything. Once you're sold on a theory, every piece of information is going to, if you really believe in whatever your theory is, it's going to feed that in some way or another. That's that's the problem with sticking to a theory, you know. So I try to try to look at it from a pretty open mind and, you know, see it, see it from a wide angle lens, so to speak. It can mean a lot of things. This can mean a lot of things, or nothing. It could just be a line of dialogue. It sure could, because our memories are constructed. More like putting together an ever-changing jigsaw puzzle than replaying a video. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I remember this. <laughs> it was that one girl that was on this street, but no, it was actually a guy, and it was actually a dirt road. Exactly. That's, yeah. Hmm. Red's best line was, of course, almost as if John was talking to the audience, would you honestly believe any answer I gave? I, I laughed so hard when he said that. <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep. Well, the audience wouldn't either. I mean, let's be honest. That's they what, wouldn't. It was totally thrown in there for the audience. I swear it was. It was like, it's like, even if I told you myself, you're still not going to believe it. No, absolutely not. Even if I Ferris bueller the end credits and the final frame, you still aren't going to believe it. <laughs> well, most of the show centered around other characters reacting to Red. That was primarily what happened while Red just worked his way through the field to get to Sinclair. But along the way... We find out that he supports a homeless shelter and has a bestie named Marnie. He meets this homeless woman that you talked about named Dolores, who he really comes to sympathize with. Not just because she leads him to Sinclair, but he genuinely seems to feel for her. So much so that he gives her friend a proper burial when they identify him. That was actually a very touching scene. I didn't expect I was trying to figure out what the angle was. Like, what's he going to use Dolores for? Because clear, I, yep, cl- clearly his homeless shelter is a front. Like, it's, it's, it's his network of spies, like the hotel uh, cleaner people and the, uh, and the garbage men. And 
the, the, the whole his, city works for him. It's his little birds from Game of Thrones. Exactly it's right. Little, it's exactly yeah. right. So, yeah. I was touched. I thought it was very sweet. It was sweet. But I do think Dolores is going to come up again for some reason. Yeah, he's going to send her undercover. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> okay. What could she... What could? That's basically the one character. What could he possibly gain from her? She's very observant. She knew the car type, the style of the guy's suit and everything. All right. That's so fair. Maybe she's just, she's just a little spy. I could come back, I guess. Maybe. Well, Sinclair ultimately is scooped up by Red before the feds can get to him. For what reason, we don't know yet, but we can theorize. So here we are. I mean, that's your question, really. Or my question. One of our questions. What do you do? You have any theories yet, or is it still like you just your mind can't even process? What could you possibly need this guy for? Or is it for something he did in the past? The only thing I can think of is that to undo something. Yeah, the only thing I can think of is, um, like he's setting something up. Like he wants to create a clone of somebody else to make a point or a statement of some kind, either to maybe members of the cabal that are still out there or to Ian Garvey specifically or something else. Like he, he's trying to set up a stage because now he has a double maker and a fire starter. So what would, what would you be trying to do with that combination? Oh, that's right. He's got a, that's right. I forgot about that. Good job, Troy. You get a treat. Man, Ruby rats. Uh, mm. <laughs> maybe, huh? Maybe what is going on is he setting it up so Liz can kill Garvey and get away with it. That'd be cool. By burning his house down or burning, lighting something on fire, and then he packs and the his then he packs his fire. bones in the suitcase, <laughs> or he's going to take. Hmm, he's going to take. Him to the same to a same similar house to where he held Liz when that house was on fire, like recreate the scene of the, the night of the events. Mm-hmm. Potentially, and he's gonna use the double maker to make people that look like those people. Could be that'd be fun. Recreate it. Mm, it's like a little dollhouse. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> this would be fun. You know what? That part's not gonna play out until the end. I can almost feel that, but. Uh, you you researched the books that they were talking about. Yeah, I thought this so was interesting. Close in on this. Yeah, so they're having their little book club conversation, and the the three books that they talked about was uh, the Wizard of Earthsea. Uh, the story is set in the fictional. Uh, were, hey, whoa, 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 were were the books that they talked about were not was. Okay. Hey, if you're gonna talk about books, how about we get the words right, sir? Grammar. Okay? <sighs> Grammar police. Anyway, a Wizard of Earthsea is a story set in the fictional. Uh, archipelago, archipelago. I can never say that word. Anyways, it's yes. set, it's basically set in a weird world called Ursi and centers around a young mage named Jed, born in a village in the island of Gaunt. He displays great power while still a boy and joins the school of wizardry, where he prickly nature drives him into conflict with one of his fellows. During a magic duel, Jed's spell goes awry and releases a shadow creature that attacks him. And then the novel follows his journey as he seeks to be free of that creature. Like mm. Red trying to find the goodness in the darkness of the Mexican cavefish cave, potentially. Interesting. So that, that mm. was interesting. Uh, the double uh, that talks about double gangers centers on a government clerk who goes mad. It deals Maybe like Red did. Maybe like Red did. Potentially. Uh, it deals with the internal psychological struggle of its main character, Yakov Petrovich who repeatedly encounters someone who is his exact double in appearance, but confident, aggressive, and extroverted characteristics that are the polar opposites to those of the pushover protagonist. Uh Uh-oh. Russian, too. Like, so Katarina's a spy, Red's a spy, but Katarina's more awesome, and I'm not so awesome, potentially. Uh, Okay, so then we had aiding and abetting. Mm -hmm. Uh, the central figure, uh, Hildegard Wolf, is a fraudulent psychiatrist. Working... Hildegard. Hildegard. Hildegard Wolf. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Hildegard Wolf is a fraudulent psychiatrist working in Paris. She has two patients, each of whom claim to be Lord Lucan, an English earl who was an actual event in London in 1974, killed his daughter's nanny, mistaking her for his wife, whom he did intend to murder. <laughs> what? 
That's funny. So you got this guy who actually kills the nanny thinking it's the wife, and then you have another guy who's like, yeah, I'm totally that guy. <laughs> hmm. So That's pretty interesting. Interesting. I'm red. No, I'm red. I'm red. No, I'm red. Thanks for looking that up, man. That's pretty clever. Yeah. So good choice of books there. I thought that was very interesting on how it sheds light into the whole world of the blacklist. Absolutely. Well, you know they were intentional. I'm sure they were. Yeah. So you guys might want to look up those books and see find, find out some more information. You might get some c- cool clues to what's coming up. Much like the Lost Book Club, we can start the Blacklist Book Club now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's it from this particular episode. We've still got a lot more show, but that's pretty much it from character perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That was a really interesting twist. I love the concept. Love the... Uh... Uh, John Noble and Martha, two guest stars in the same episode. That was fantastic. Two songs. Uh, it, it's all about coming up doubles. <laughs> it's coming up doubles. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Man, I had, a, I had a really good time with this episode. I was not expecting it to be as, as fun as it was. And I really, I, I really got hooked on the concept because it's so rare. You get a clever twist on a cliche I, that I really don't like. So as soon as I was hinted at that, I'm like, oh, my God. And it was I thought it was really clever. I mean, yeah, far-fetched, but still clever. So, yeah, I had a really – I had a fun time with this episode. Sweet. All right. Well, we will be right back F with – we will be back with Red's Rhetoric right after this. What if you could live your life without limits, where every desire you ever imagined could be fulfilled? Experience Westworld, a show where every human's dark side will be revealed. After watching each episode, listen to Beyond Westworld, a podcast featuring humans and hosts from around the park, diving deep into HBO's illustrative narrative. Every hero has a code, and so do you. Download your itinerary and the show at beyondwestworldpodcast.com or your podcast app of choice. Hi, it's Megan Boone, and you're listening to Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Welcome to Red's Rhetoric, that part of the show where we play two scenes from this week's episode of The Blacklist, and then you get to vote which one is your favorite over in our poll on the website. Just look for Sinclair the Third, and you'll be able to vote there through next week. Now, apparently, you would all be happy to see the last member of the hand put in the ground as hashtag Red20, that's in 20 bullets, one last time we met. This week, our first clip comes when Red talks about his five days of enlightenment. Where are you on reinstatement? I have my fitness for duty evaluation tomorrow. 50 minutes of pure reflection and self-evaluation? You've been to therapy. God, yes. Therapy helped me become an entirely different person. Agent Navabi is ready to meet. Several years ago, one of my bankers in Liechtenstein shared with me some unpublished works by Carl Jung, handwritten notes on napkins, journals, and such. It was easily the most enlightening, consequential five days I've ever spent in a chalet. What about that week in Davos? Yes, well, that was a cottage. Our second clip comes when Red and Sinclair talk about starting a book club. My name is Raymond Reddington. Should I know who you are? I know who you are. You're obsessive compulsive. You have a mind-numbingly patient and thoughtful attention to detail. I've admired your work for some time. This is a strange way to show it. I'm a strange fellow. I've heard whispers of your work for years now. Stories of your leisure demand, your ability to put a man in two places at once. The concept of bilocation is appealing, even if not without consequence. I suspect you're a fan of quantum theory. I've read quite a bit of Schrodinger myself. I, I'm more Dostoevsky man. <laughs> yes, of course, the double. I love a good doppelganger story. What about... Ursula Le Guin. Oh, uh, a wizard of Earthsea. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, delightful tale. And aiding and abetting. By Muriel Spark. One of my favorite British writers. I- I'm sorry, what's your name again? It's not important. What is important is that you and I may have much more in common than just reading. Crime. Yes. Which was your favorite? 
If you wish for some time of reflection, vote hashtag Red Chalet. Or if you can't wait to dig into a tale of doppelgangers, vote hashtag Red Double. Now we move on to Special Agent Intel. We start with Marta Bolden pondering. Red has a skeleton he wants to take back into hiding. Perhaps his best defense against Garvey and whatever those remains imply is to prove, using a doppelganger, the dead man is alive. Does he need a fire set by the released arsonist we met to implicate this imposter in another crime to prove he's a real guy? Perhaps the body Garvey now has is of the man who set Lizzie's fire five years or years ago. I've always had a sneaking suspicion this is the man Lizzie shot and Red wants to protect her, burying the consequences and implications of that event. It's not a bad idea. No, that's kind of clever. It's kind of like then we hire Gregory DeVry to be himself. To prove yes. to the bad guys that he's actually, hey, look, I'm still Red. That guy's the guy that you think is turning you all in and everything. Go kill that guy. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Potential. Uh, Anita Luongo said it was heartbreaking to see Raymond's expression when Harold said, some people are truly alone in this world. Red's reply was a short and emotional. Yep. Then he went to comfort the lady whose friend got killed by Sinclair. Uh, it's as if he knows completely alone unless he was thinking about the caudacity of his life or his exterminated family on that particular Christmas Eve when entering the house. There was all that blood, just all that blood. I noticed that Red's mugshot has been updated. It was shown through the reflection of a glass when Singleton was at the FBI's uh, task force room. The pictures were side by side showing a back in the day Red next to today's Red. It seemed a way to emphasize the ongoing uncertainty of Red's true identity. This would match all the double theories that go from Red being Red Arena to the real Red versus imposter Red. The whole Red debate underlined by the therapy helped me become an entirely different person comment. Interesting choice of books mentioned by Sinclair and Red. Uh, Dostrovsky, Double, and Ursula Le Guin's A Wizard of Ursi, and Aiding and Abetting by Muriel Spark, partly inspired by true events, as we just mentioned. Hmm. TC Casa, I don't know how I feel about Detective Singleton. Last episode, he appeared to be dirty, but for some reason I felt different this week. He seems to be another chess piece in Evil Glenn's game. When he was being shown the connection between Liz and Red... He seemed to genuinely understand the situation. Granted, we saw a quick reaction, but I don't know. I don't know if he's good or bad. I don't know if he's dirty or not. I don't know if he's a pawn or a friend of Liz. Guess we'll find out. Someday. <laughs> we'll J- probably find out next episode. I, I actually think we found out this episode, but nobody believes me. So Yeah. Uh, James said this was a damn good episode considering there wasn't a whole lot of action. For one thing, it was a blacklister that, in my opinion, was very, very plausible. Hey, I just want to stop you real quick. There was a whole lot of action in the first five minutes. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Wink, wink, nod, nod. All right. Who said seven o'clock was off limits? <laughs> I don't know, but there there were a lot of people complaining about that sex scene, and I'm just sitting here going, that's what we got a problem with? <laughs> you got wood chippers and stuff. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's a lot worse <laughs> over there on the uh, uh, Alphabet Network. <laughs> right. I've I've seen a far far worse than that. That, that was pretty... Tepid, I thought. Uh, two things that caught my eye. One was the absolute glee in Cooper when Red told him about the corpses and the 24 murders who had been acquitted. And two, the final, I am a widow, a mother, a cop, and a daughter. I also like that Liz had photographed Singleton, that Singleton had photographed Red, and the final Liz Singleton confrontation. Finally, the, I felt I was being watched while at the ballet. Am I the only one who thought Red's obsession with the ballet was to do with Jennifer? Mm-hmm. That was a big, huh? I didn't see that one coming in my case. We all did. We all went, Whoa. Yep. Whoa. Exactly. Ears propped up and everything. Yep. Head Man. tilted to the side, just like dogs do. Whoa. And once again, like, we're okay with, with bodies turning up left and right and people going through the wood chipper and bloody and gargling broken glass put a little rub-a-dub-dub on top of somebody and hey 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 stop your moaning back it up <laughs> the kids, are, the kids are still awake Aaron. the kids are still awake oh the, don't let them watch blacklist bad stuff happens there all right kira adler so much going on here naughty stuff not bad stuff naughty stuff kira adler so much going on here the detective apparently being used by evil glenn now brought into the truth of the task force red acquired the alibi 
Poor Walter looks to have lost pieces of his mind again. <laughs> Doubles are a theme. We now have the Swan Lake ballerina and a young Liz is a ballerina tied to red. Liz described her mother as a prima ballerina before the director called Liz's red called Red's Liz. prima called Liz Red's prima ballerina. Several references to imposters and doppelgangers in just this episode. Yeah, I didn't want to mention the director called her uh, Red's ballerina too. So I think it comes up enough to where I I don't see any other way it's not Liz, but that's just me. Uh, several references to imposters and doppelgangers in just this episode. Is Red a double of the real Red? Is there a double in the suitcase? Was there a double of Katarina at some point? Imposters everywhere. <laughs> Two True Katarinas story. would be interesting. No, it wouldn't. But yeah, one goes into the ocean and kills herself. The other one's still alive, and we'll see her later on. That would be interesting. Possible. That still sounds like a twin theory or a doppelganger. I don't like that. No. Well, it's not no, a twin you... theory. It's a doppelganger theory. So it's literally... Ma- I, don't, get, I don't like either one. Get one to make it look like she went into the ocean. Red believes that she went into the ocean, and yet she's still alive, and she's puppet mastering this whole thing. Now that... Hey, hey. Now that... That could be something. That could be something. That could be something. Maybe because he's old enough. Maybe Sinclair did arrange that. Made it seem too red like Katarina killed herself, but the whole time she is not dead. That could very well maybe. Because he isn't he's he's been familiar with his work before, but has not met him personally. Exactly. And maybe he thinks, now I've got you, you can help lead me to Katarina. Potentially. I, I just I like that idea. I like that idea. Who's next? Me or you? I uh, I'll go. Grace Norman's back and said, I love this episode and found it much more enjoyable than the past few. I think for a while, the whole Liz storyline was incredibly awkward and I didn't c- care about what she was doing. I just wanted to see the task force. But this episode has the show back on its game with several great quotes, great music, and a wonderful John Noble as our blacklister. For the first time in weeks, I'm excited to see the next episode. The plot thickens with Evil Glenn, Ian, Ian Garvey. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, Monica's- like nobody calls him Garvey anymore. They all call him Evil Glenn. I love it. Yep, Evil Glenn or Ian or Ian. Somebody was it? Somebody on Reddit like earlier this week said, "Can someone fill me in on the Evil Glenn thing?" I'm I don't get it. <laughs> it was like yes. I bet you they're doing it now. We've made it to the page. We made it to the Reddit pages. Everybody's doing it. <laughs> I don't even remember. Like I I don't remember. It's, I've so many people have said it, so I don't even know. Monica Stolfa, O Singleton. You may or may not be a good cop. But now that you've seen the post office, I fear your days are numbered. Red's army is growing. First lo- a logistic planner and a money launderer, then an arsonist and a doppelganger creator. Red is certainly five steps ahead of everyone. I don't know about that because he still don't have them bones. The issue of memory was brought up more than once. That tells me the accuracy of either Liz's or maybe Red's recollection of things will be put on display. One side note. We, and I think that that could be a reference to what you're saying. Maybe he does remember what happened to Katarina different than what he finds out actually happened to her. So that's why the memory thing he's so prominent about. Mm-hmm. One side note, we now know Liz took ballet, but I'm confused. We don't know that for sure. but Well, we know she took it, yeah. But I'm confused. From season one, we see Red watching a little girl perform Swan Lake with the program since 1987. She was much too old to be Liz at that time. I you, concur. Yeah. If that girl was in the past, and if that girl was from 1987, that's the other thing. You don't know what time frame you're looking at when that girl's on stage. It's, you don't you, know you're, you're getting if sh- that program is actually in 1987. Could be too. Like you don't know if he's in 1987 with that program or if he carried that to that show. Very possible as well. Like he's had that program for many years because of whatever happened at that year. Right. All okay. good thoughts. All good thoughts. Hey, all good thoughts. All great thoughts. Man, well, we have reached the end of the episode, and I got some news for you. Can I drop some news? Sure, go ahead. Two weeks. I won't be here for the next two weeks. What? Uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry to drop this ball in your lap, but uh, I'm not going to be here. So this is the actual experiment where you said, yeah, I should just do the show by myself? Yeah, awesome. have fun, man. You'll uh, be all right. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> that would not be What's fun. Gonna that would not be fun for anybody. Uh, if you remember back in season two, for those of you that have longtime listeners, uh, we had special agent Rory and special agent Bill do a little tribute to Aaron and I at the season two finale. So I thought, you know what? It'd be great to hear from Rory again. Plus, he did those awesome pre-shows for us in season four. So let's bring Rory onto the show. So special agent Rory is going to be here the next two weeks filling in for Aaron. Yes. And I'm not bailing. It is my annual 
going to the South by Southwest Film Festival trip, and it involves a lot of work on my end. So a lot of work. It's so yeah. So it's hard to do the podcast for that because believe it or not, we do put a lot of work into this. Maybe not this one specifically, but most of them. I thought we did pretty good this week. <laughs> coming back, coming, since coming back after the Olympics and you know trying to get back on the sleep schedules, staying up oh, till man. three in the morning, watching hockey and bobsledding and curling and. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to the festival. Did you watch the Olympics? I did watch a, a good chunk of the curling. I did watch a good chunk of the bob. Really? Why curling? It's just fascinating. Why the, the strategy? <laughs> Why you sent me a clip? He sent me a clip of the slow motion version of curling. That was funny. <laughs> that was agonizing. <laughs> I'm like, why are you sending me this slower? It's already the slowest Olympic sport oh. ever in the history of man. It was great. <laughs> I'm like, you're not Olympic Olympians. You're dads. This is like dad beer night. <laughs> now, now, curling isn't the most exciting sport in the world, but the story behind how the men's team got there was actually really fascinating. And that's why I watched right. most of the men's curling, just to see if I mean, Schuster can pull it out. I'm sure a lot of people love curling, and I don't mean to poo-poo your event if you're a big fan. I know it's been there since like the the inception or whatever. I just, I just couldn't get it. I'm just like, what are they doing with the brooms? This is so weird. They make it go faster so that the rock doesn't spin. I can't, I can't even. I can't even. <laughs> anyway, so I'll be back in two weeks or three weeks, three weeks, whatever it is. Uh, so I will be off for the next two episodes. So Rory's going to take over and I'm sure he's going to knock it out of the park. It'll be fun. So It'll be fun. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to conclude this episode. So be sure to follow us on Twitter at the Blacklist GSM, where we live tweet during the East Coast feed genuinely when we can. And we use the show's hashtag, the Blacklist. Don't forget to follow us on Tumblr, Instagram, and also join the Facebook group. Just search for the Blacklist Exposed. Talk about the show, the podcast, or your favorite whatever. You can also subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, or your favorite podcast player of choice. You can even listen from the website. But if you are really on the go, make sure you download our app for iOS and Android, powered by Spreaker. You will find all the intel and analysis about this episode for Mr. Riley Sinclair III by visiting theblacklistexposed.com. Big thanks for listening, and don't forget to answer our profiling question, why does Red need Sinclair? Or is Singleton a good cop or bad cop? (laughs) All right, I think that's going to do it for this week. So you guys have a great week. All right, we'll see you next week. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie right. We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at 5 Popcorn. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.